So this is the Women for Fire panel, and I think you have been at the lunch, and uh, we're just going to continue conversations. We want to make this very informal. I have two really awesome guests, which are Vivian looking, well, I don't even know how to describe this, like awesome today. <laughs> and we have Kate, and they will introduce themselves, and we will, we will talk about uh, Women in Fire, about the maybe the male bias in fire and how we can increase the female perspective in it about being a woman in tech. And I invite you all, like, please join in. If you want to say something, if you want to add an experience, just raise your hand. We have Miriam here with a mic, and you can just join in this panel. Um, this one you saw this morning, the goals of this Women for Fire. I'm, I'm extremely excited to get such so many positive comments today about people reaching out to me saying that it's so nice that we're doing this. So, well, that's really great. Um, let's quickly introduce, you've seen me a few times. My name is Martina, I'm responsible for the marketing within uh, Firely. I live in Amsterdam and I love Minneapolis, so I'm having a good time here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I used to work in financial services and in a corporate environment. So from that perspective, I have a lot of different experiences of being a woman in like different crowds. And I have to say that in a corporate world, it, I have more examples of having a straight position, position than I have now in a more developer tech setting, but it's still interesting to talk about it. Um, I'm mainly gonna be hosting, we have Vivian. Can you introduce yeah, yourself? Uh, Vivian, I'm <laughs> the, everyone who walks in just starts laughing at me. <laughs> like, it's such a great reaction. Uh, so I'm one of the product managers at Google. Um, I started as a nursing assistant in college and really came in from the healthcare side, which people probably know is a very female, heavy and oriented uh, way in the you know, industry. Um, and so I kind of found my way into tech and I am one of the, I'm the only female on my team now and I'm, I think, under 5% of my organization, um, which is an interesting stat, but we're working on it. But I think, you know, it's uh, something that is a little bit kind of jarring compared to healthcare, um, but it's also one of the reasons that it's so important to have these conversations because, um, and we'll talk about this, but like getting clinical representation often also means getting female representation and, and what that looks like and making sure everyone feels welcome, but we're also um, well represented in the spec as well. So, hi everyone, I'm Kate Eberle. I'm from Australia, I live in Queensland. Um, I work for CSIRO, which is um, Australia's National Science Agency. Some people call it Cicero, Cesiro, all the names. We answer to everything. Um, and I'm the national lead for Sparked, which is Australia's first fire accelerator. And similar to Vivian, I started in healthcare. I started out as a dietitian, um, worked in health, uh, worked in federal health, so heavily female dominated, and went down to work on the first ever electronic health record trial um, in Australia and all of a sudden got thrown into the world of HL7 and standards and tech and all the rest of it and um, yeah and then made my way up and through and continued in this environment and I have to say the biggest challenge I've had is not being the only female in the room but being the only extrovert in the room so that's been a bigger <laughs> challenge for me often than actually being a female. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, how many of y'all started in healthcare? Not like maybe not traditionally on tech side, but actually started on the healthcare side. Okay, so the, actually less than that's surprising. So all everyone else is traditionally more on the came in in a technical role. Public health. Okay, that cat, that cat. So like, well, I meant more of like a non-computer science type type role. But, yeah. So Vivian, you kicked off this initiative, I think, last year. You were one of the people saying, we, ha we have to put this on stage. And I think you even uh, dared to make yourself a little uncomfortable to use the words menstrual cycle on a stage with 400 people in the room. Um, you started by pointing out that maybe there is a male bias in fire. I, and I started Googling, there is a male bias in healthcare, like a lot, but um, well, as well probably in fire. And you started by pointing out that, for example, menstrual cycle has not been like really taken care of in the standard. I, I put this on the slide because after dev days, that immediately sparked a conversation in Zulep about how to deal with that. So I thought like, did we trigger something last year and how can we make sure that we increase that female voice in the standards? 
Can you share a bit your experience so far? Yeah, so as a bit of background, um, I think my first dev days was probably six or seven years ago, um, and it was my first introduction into Fire for the most part. Um, and back then it was smaller, and it was still in Amsterdam consistently, um, and I was young and sprightly and was so excited to go to Amsterdam for the first time. And when I tell this story and I look back on it, I remember I was so terrified of dev days that every day I went home in my hotel room and went right, be right to bed, which as a you know 20 something year old, you're in Amsterdam for the first time. Um, I didn't take any advantage of like you know all the social gatherings, which I hope to see all of you there. I probably won't be wearing the wig anymore. It's really itchy. But I didn't take any advantage of any of the social gatherings because it was, I was one, terrified of you know, being kind of the female in tech, but also I didn't know anything about fire. And so half the conversations, I just had like a doe and headlights. And as a blonde girl, you already have that anyway. And so you know, I come to standing where I am now, I think that girl would be very proud of me. But like the, a lot of that was kind of just forcing myself into the conversations. And a lot of people aren't comfortable doing that. And it, I'm not comfortable doing it either. Um, so I think <laughs> fast forward to last year when my nightmare was telling you know 400 white men that I had a menstrual cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Very proud of myself for that one. But I went home and was like, oh, I can't believe I said that. But it's true. So I, so I actually looked into it. And then multiple people came up came up and I think actually we had a conversation of that there are a lot of different ways. Like there's, it's not really a condition. That sounds really bad. And actually pregnancy has the same problem because we don't know necessarily. Although I think you have a good pregnancy solution, I remember. Uh, but it's not really a condition. It's not really an observation because it happens over a period of time. Um, and I, you know, I, I think there is a, someone had a good solution, but I, now I can't remember. Anyway, it still hasn't been solved as far as I know, although would love to hear everyone's opinion. I think uh, Kate has uh, been working on it. To, we're going to start to work on it um, yeah. in Australia. And I think that's, you know, one of the key things for me is it's about diversity, full stop. And, and you know, Women for Fire is a really great thing and we need to definitely get more women in and we need to make sure um, that we are prioritising yeah. Everything that needs There's to be. Oh, yeah, I'm already back. I've, my voice is so loud anyway. Um, and forever documented to talk about your menstrual cycle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, but part of it is, and, and what we're looking at in Australia, is we're driving it by clinical priorities and we're making sure that we've got really strong diversity around driving that priority and, and saying, well, how do we actually start to model this? And how do we model pregnancy? And how do we model the menstrual cycle? But also, how do we model menopause, perimenopause, postmenopause? And so all of that, but part of that's making sure you've got the right people in the room. And it's not just about having women in the room, it's about having the right skill sets in the room to actually start to do this. And so the key thing for me, I think this is a fantastic initiative, but part of it's also making sure that we're really conscious around making sure we've got the consumer voice in the room, we've got clinical voices in the room, we've got all the voices in the room, because it's actually that entire skill set, that entire lived experience, that entire diversity that's going to make sure that we build these standards truly fit for purpose for everyone. I think to add to that, the, to, go back, and to go back to what I was saying, where um, oftentimes we say, like, how do we get more women in the community and how do we get more clinicians in the community? Um, I don't think necessarily those are two different aspects no. because especially you know, in tech, as I said, that, that might not be where to find the women who can add and contribute a lot. Maybe it's the clinicians who can kind of yeah. help us with the clinical mapping and things like that. And, bring that diversity. And, and you're right, like it comes together, because I mean, Graham gave me this challenge in Australia a few years back where we started doing, and I was the only woman in the room. Ran a Connectathon, first ever Connectathon, terminology services back in 2016. I was, I was token female. Um, as I said, the hardest thing for me in that environment was not being token female, but you know, kicking off a session, doing some presentations. Hey, anyone got a question? And dead silence. So that was hard for me to understand. People would rather talk to each other via Slack and Zulip than actually communicate. But, you know, Graham's like, how do we get, you know, two challenges, Kate? You've got to get more women in the community in Australia, and you've got to get more clinicians into the community in Australia. And by getting more clinicians into the community in Australia, we've really been able to get a whole lot more diversity around skills and gender and age, um, which is really fantastic into the community and starting to drive it. But now what we're starting to see is 
Um, we are starting because we're starting to see more young people come into the community. We're seeing um, more women actually getting into tech, into Australia, and then getting into jobs. So we're now not just only getting women in because they're clinicians, but we're also getting women in who are software engineers within um, the software tech companies that are actually coming along, which is really fantastic because we can't get more women engineers here unless we get more women into STEM and we keep them in STEM and then we get them into jobs and we actually get them into this community. So we've kind of got, you know, there's only so much we can do here, um, but we can, need to just keep making this a really welcoming environment, but actually getting more clinicians in will actually start to get more women in. Does, I'm curious, does anyone have experience with chats that you were in that, we are actually, that you were actually talking about these type of things, like your menstrual cycle and how to code it in fire, or like there's some smiles there? No real experience. Can you share something? Yeah, hi, I'm Corina from Germany, and we um, were working on a research project like building um, um, forms um, based on fire questionnaire, having like all questions around a menstrual cycle. And that use case, I think, was based on whether the COVID-19 vaccination would change the menstrual cycle. Yeah, so we did that. <laughs> And, and may I ask, and all answers are good, how, uh, how did that make you feel to talk about that? Well, I think it's wonderful, but I also have like a very good boss, like, and we're very trying, much trying to promote also like using fire and um, gathering like information on gender and, you know, for unbiased algorithms and so on. So our department is like very focused on that. Do you feel like you had good um, community support from uh, like as, the broader fire community as you're trying to do something that, you know, as we're saying, maybe doesn't have as much uh, implementation support. Did you feel like you had outlets to reach out to and support from us or could that have been improved? That's a good question. I think I was too shy to go on Sulip. <laughs> yeah, that's I think that's like a lot of with the, that use case. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think that's a lot of the theme, too. It's just yeah. like, <laughs> but next time I will. <laughs> Can you wait a second for the mic? Yeah, thank you. I just want to comment that I think something that's really interesting is I'm hearing this, um, shame isn't the right word, right? But like this sensitivity around talking about menstrual cycles as if we are talking about where we are in our own right now, right? And it's like, no, we're talking about something that roughly half of the population experiences as a vital health sign. And so... A, I think it's wonderful to have non-menstruating people in the room talking about it because that depersonalizes it further. But just to remember that like, we're not talking about our own personal experience, we're talking about something that a lot of bodies do and is really crucial, right? And so, yeah, having a diversification of voices talking about it can help with that. And also just, I don't know, being really blunt about like, hello, this is, you know, like, yeah, I don't know, depersonalizing it feels for, really important. And for context, this comment came out of like a broader, like I can't believe we haven't figured this out, right? Comment um, where, and some, I had similar around consent of like the fact that consent isn't normative. Uh, like if you ask any woman, she would've been like, yeah, we should probably figure that out like originally. And so um, I completely agree. And I think that was like the theme of, you know, it's not just menstrual cycle, and let's go figure that out, which was, you know, in Graham and in, in classic boy fashion, it was like problem solution. And I was like, no, no, no. It was let's the, the let, let, let's, let's, and yeah, it was like, did you see like, those words? Uh, let's work here to characterize <laughs> this, this period, this period thing. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> thing. I don't I remember this, I brought it back, it was first that I remember. Um, and so it was definitely, it was more of like, you know, the conversation because I think, um, it was just such a, a moment of, you know, this needs to be a bigger conversation because there's probably a million examples like this one um, that just would have been, you know, had there been more inclusivity in the, in the room um, or a, a representation in the room, uh, we probably wouldn't, I wouldn't have had to, had said that on stage in 2023 or whatever. Um, maybe a question, because I gladly see that there's also a lot of men here in this room. Maybe you are equally awkward talking about this. How, if you would be talking about the fire standard and coding and developing, and you would like think about this, do, do you have an idea of this? Do you have 
Do you experience that, or would it make you feel uncomfortable? No. Good meal answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think um, it's important to recognize there are a lot of underrepresented and un um, underspecified parts of data standardization, no matter where you look. And part of um, you know, our job as a uh, standards development organization is to bring together the people who want to make their various ways of representing. So it's not that there are many areas where there are too many options for representing this kind of information. What we're trying to do is gradually bring to some consistency that representation. Um, and so I think that's a, in some sense, it's a normal process, but the actual subject of the information is something that, you know, we, uh, we need a lot of input into how to, you know, do the, do the next area of health uh, and make it better. Um, I feel like, you know, uh, we might look to examples like in the Gravity Project where they, there was a lot of prerequisite work in domain analysis and coding that was required before we could even sort of get to like effective data exchange. And I feel like we're going to keep having those kinds of areas emerge because that's the nature of our understanding of health. I have a story bigger about standards, but it connects. And I'll go personal and then I'll go into public health. So I was at my doctor's office and she goes, oh, you're pregnant. And I was like, six years ago. Right, because there's there's no process on how to take it out. Um, so right, like I was like, well, it was six years ago. But then I was talking to one of my epis who pulls data from an EHR, and he's like, and he goes, you know, like we see women in drinking, and I'm like, pregnant women in drinking. I'm like, no, you see EHRs that have incorrect data that's being shared. So even without getting into fire, like we're making decisions on data that's wrong because of the standard of how it should be properly recorded and when. And when, when was I know? I mean, I know the moment I was no longer pregnant, but it was important for my doctor to know that I had been pregnant for a certain amount of time after that. So it's, it's just, there's no really good understanding of that. It, it is, and it's hard. I mean, this is what we're tackling with right now, and Danielle was speaking about it with Sheridan this morning and Brett, because, you know, often on the form it's just pregnancy status, yes, no, and then that gets recorded in the record, and that comes back to the work around use cases. Why do I want this information? How am I going to share this information? Why is it important? What clinically do I need to record for what purpose? And it's not this just, it's important, let's just shove it into the standard. We actually, you know, again, get all the diversity of views, views and really understand how this data is going to be used from primary use at that time in my pregnant yes, no, all the way through to now secondary use of that data. And, you know, the work that you were talking about, Dan, is what's so important because we need to start to make sure that this is really driven by use cases and priorities and we're truly understanding why we're recording and exchanging this information. And consent, because the second that we 100%. <laughs> have period start end dates of pregnancy, I do not want the state of Texas to know those things. And so, like, yep. Good shout out to also, yeah, you know, uh, patient sharing. Yeah, I mean, part of it is a standards thing, but a lot of it is even broader than that. It's about what are the processes and standardizing processes, and also recognizing that different processes need different things, because this particular conversation uh, around the menstrual cycle, we dug into. There's a whole bunch of different layers of information that you need to know depending on what it is that you're trying to track. Exactly. Are you interested in, are you potentially pregnant or not? You need one level of information. If you have issues uh, with respect to your menstrual cycle in terms of pain or irregularity, then there's a different level of information that you need to track. And different clinicians, different organizations, have different approaches to, to managing all of that. And from a data standards perspective, we can't, we can't fix what the initial process around data collection and capture already has wrong. Um, we, we can capture what you put in well and hopefully consistently, but uh, to a certain extent, fire is a driver for change around the process 
because by reducing the barriers to interoperability, we make more visible the fact that there's this other layer that is somewhat of a basket case that we need to make better. Um, you brought up a very important topic, which is like you want to track your menstrual cycle, maybe, maybe to look at your pain. What is the normal level of pain during menstrual cycle? Yeah. There's how, actually how, how do you measure it? And there are there are ways. Yeah. But and also, like there's now I think a project coming out of Germany that is for the first time looking at what are normal <laughs> levels of pain during menstrual cycle. And they're only looking at uh, women between 18 to 20 something, so I'm already past that. Um, there's also, like, the, the topic that I want to get into is the lack of knowledge with, for women's health care. Mm -hmm. This is why it's actually so hard for us to figure out what process is, because nobody looked at women's health so far. We, women were just considered, like, smaller men. <laughs> and that's it. It's fine. All the medication, all treatment, it's fine. It will be okay. And also the other part is that, that was mentioned earlier, um, perimenopause, menopause, how does that get diagnosed? Like doctors don't even know <laughs> how to diagnose any of that. There's like, there, there was a, um, a famous actor, Halle Berry, who recently spoke up that she was mis her menopause was misdiagnosed as herpes by her doctor. And it's like, whoa, aren't we in the 21st century? Like, women have had, have, have went through menopause for quite some time. Like, why don't doctors, gynecologists, know what that looks like? Most of the time, the, the problem is that women are seen now only as, oh, you're either fertile or you're paying taxes. How about... <laughs> <laughs> How about you might get into, like you might not have kids or you might have kids later. You might be more predisposed to get into menopause earlier. Nobody knows. There's just an, an like territory that, that nobody knows. You go through menopause, perimenopause, you're still expected to be smiling, pr productive. You're still expected to do all of that. And I think because there's lack of research, I think it's really important to give the women the opportunity to have, however, access to their own data. And because the panel on the patient uh, empowerment was so important and is so important, and I think you, the US is actually doing a much better job than, unfortunately, a lot of the European countries that don't want the patient to have access to their own data to interpret it. At this point, when research in women's health is not paid because there's no incentive to do that. So the best way for a woman to understand her own health is to look at it. Yeah, that's all. Sorry. So maybe, um, yeah, give me a sec, okay? Because I'm also very curious because we, I think a good thing is that we're talking about this and the good thing is that there is development in this, but a good thing is as well, we gather now here do you have ideas of what can we do to at least, we cannot solve this whole world issue today, but what we can do to stimulate these conversations to happen and to move forward these, uh, these topics? <laughs> that was a quick one, Kate. <laughs> I will say, as ridiculous as I look right now, this is probably gonna be shared on social media and people are gonna have to see this picture and they're gonna click on it and be like, why the hell is she wearing that wig? And someone's gonna see, oh, she was you know, doing a panel on Women for Fire. And so some of it is just ridiculous things like this and our shirts and talking about it and like being an advocate and being an obnoxious advocate, if that's what it takes. I hope I don't go viral for this though. Um, but I think you know, some of it is escalating it up and finally being so gracious to let us having the space and talking about it um, but also <laughs> time machine no I mean a lot of this goes back to it's not something just the fire community can solve I think we can push on the right things and do what we can but it's also 
advocating you know better research in women's health and things like that that are just <laughs> global problems that yeah, yeah, they don't pay me enough money to, to solve. <laughs> and a lot of it is, it's about you taking it back. You know, there's only so much we can do in this environment, but how do we take it back into what we're doing in our own countries and our own organisations and how we're advocating and driving it? So, you know, there is the work that we're doing around AUCDI. There's the work that Canada's doing, the, the work that's happening here, and all other countries are starting to look at these things around data modelling. And I agree, like, because to your point, Saloid, like, at FIRE is only exchanging what's in the systems. What we're trying to do is go upstream from that and actually start to look at these data models and actually start to improve the EHRs, the EMRs and the understanding so we're actually getting the better data in those systems that we can then start to exchange. Because otherwise we're just pushing the same old stuff around in a better way, but it's just the same old stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of us making sure that within our own countries and our own way that we are actually starting to make sure that we're getting diversity in voice into the room, that we actually start to look around how we're modelling these things. And then you have to go even further upstream around advocating for, for better research. Oh, I just wanted to go back to um, the pregnancy story you had where, yeah, six years ago, because I think, and, and Lloyd's talk about the process of tracking these things, because it's, it's really important to know, especially are you pregnant or not pregnant, a lot of medications may or may not be prescribed based on pregnancy, and so someone's looking at your clinical record, they're deciding what to suggest, and they think you're pregnant, and so you're not being treated the way you might have been had the information been correct that you're not pregnant. So, you know, there's, there's all of that, too, that this, the accuracy is really important in women's health. There's a lot of um, people that are excluded from clinical trials because of medical like, just misdocumenting things like that, and it's that's a huge problem. Yeah. I was going to ask Kate. You mentioned, I think, that you man managed in Australia to get more women in the room, to get more yeah. clinicians in the room. In your spirit of bringing this back to our home countries, how did you do that? And how can we do that? Um, we actually started by focusing around the data models and the data discussion because the best way that we could grow our community and get clinicians was to talk about what's the benefit for them and how does actually FIRE actually start to make their life easier. And so when we start to have those conversations with clinicians around saying what's the data that's most important for you, because a lot of what had happened previously in Australia and I think a lot of other countries is our data models and our data definitions and our data standards were driven by what government needs. And so we always started there, and it was tail wagging dog. The best dog. representation, as they say, yeah. government. And tail wagging dog, and the view was, I'm collecting this data for government. I'm never collecting this data for me as a clinician to deliver the best possible care to my patients, my community, and to give that information to the next person in the care chain. So taking that conversation right back to why are we recording information? Why are we wanting to share information? What's this information about? Then actually starts to be the clinicians are feeling empowered around saying this is the information that needs to be in the record and this is information for me. And so really tipping that conversation on its head and our AUCDI, we started off doing a primary care data quality project which then led to developing the Australian core data set for interoperability. And that's driven by this whole conversation led by clinicians with consumers are in the room, core of the core, what's the most important information that should be recorded? Because unless we fix the data quality, we're still not sending accurate information around and the clinicians will do the easiest thing, which is not necessarily the right thing, just because they're so, like, so busy and the burden and the effort. So the information has to be of value to them. So by turning that conversation, building the community around this is what clinicians need and consumers need, and then that drives our entire process around fire in Australia. So it starts with the clinicians in the clinical design groups, and then that gets handed over to then our tech design groups to take that forward. And everything is driven about making the right thing to do, the easiest thing to do. 
And so that's driven a huge um, lot of clinicians. And the other key thing is that's happened is we've made it a truly open, transparent, anyone can come. So other things that we've probably done, which probably happened in other countries, you've always had the chosen few senior doctors that were there to be consulted. They were invited into the room, into the government consultation session. So, you know, you had to have had hit a certain stage in your career to be recognised as an expert. We have completely said it is open, it is transparent. We have over 400 people registered as part of our clinical design groups. Anyone can come. It is not invite only, anyone can turn up. So now we're starting to see junior docs coming into the room and that's fantastic because we're getting such a great representation, again, of diversity, of diversity of experience, diversity of gender, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of everything and of experience. And so that's then made it a really welcoming place where everyone feels like they can come in and they have a view and it's not just because I'm the GP that's been the GP for the last 30 years and always the GP that's consulted to the minister. I think the, one of the key words, plus a thousand to all that, but one of the things that we try and focus on too is the key word you said was welcoming. And like women are the most flywheel effect kind of species where like if you feel comfortable, you will make everyone else feel comfortable and then more women will come and feel comfortable. And all of a sudden there's a bunch of us. And so, you know, it kind of takes one and the more we can make comfortable, you know, the better off we will be because, you know, um, if someone comes and doesn't feel like they have a community, women are much less likely to stay, um, especially if they're kind of outnumbered and things like that. And so the more people, and I'm so glad we had the first time our badges, because the more people that I see wearing those and go up and say hi, because there's a 50% chance they might not know anyone and they might not know, you know, what they don't know and who they should talk to and what they're even doing here. And so um, definitely welcoming yeah. the women who do show up. Um, in terms of growing the community, have you guys ever thought about like a liaison to the women, like the uh, women in AMIA group as like a possible pipeline to like encourage additional women from, from that, the American Medical Informatics Asso Association has a women in AMIA group to try to do this. And I'm curious if either you're aware of that or know of that and thought of that as like a pipeline to grow the women in fire community. Yeah, so I think what I learned today is that, like last year we learned already that Women for Fire had like a lot of traction and people liked it and we programmed it again this year. And in between, some people have been talking, there's a little bit of activity on the Sulip channel, but like not that much, to be honest. One of the things that I'm taking home, but hopefully more people than just me, is to think like, how can we actually make this work in between those events? And indeed, what, where can we find a community? Where can, can we be a community? And maybe indeed using uh, already existing initiatives for that is a great idea. So how can we make sure that this community doesn't only gather at deaf days? And I know at the working group meetings there's also uh, women initiatives, but how can we make sure it's more than meetups at events and find ways to communicate, find ways to support each other, find ways to address topics. So yeah, that would be great and I'll definitely look into that one, and uh, it would be great, I think, if we can all do that together. But because there's not a Women for Fire Institute or organization or project lead or anyone who gets paid to do this on a daily basis, but we can make it happen, I, I think. I asked the woman at the table I was sitting at today, so tips and tricks, and I was like, oh, go to Zulip if you have any questions. And then you came over and said, well, there's a you know, Women for Fire Zulip. And I said, how many of you guys go on that every day? And they went, only if I have a question. <laughs> And it was an interesting moment where it was like a learning lesson for us of maybe this isn't, you know, maybe that's not the best place to find a community. Maybe it's engaging places that already have a communities. Like, you know, if you know anyone, we'd love to reach out um, so that we can find the best place to foster it because it probably isn't in developer chat. <laughs> We're gonna just based on feedback. Yeah, and I mean, there was a really good conversation over lunch at the table I was at where I think this is a really welcoming community already. Um, well, that's what I felt. And so it was really hard, you know, when we're having a chat, I'm like, I don't really have this lived experience of not ever feeling welcome or not ever, maybe it's because I'm an extrovert, but, um, and it's really hard because 
you know, not all of us feel that way, but this is actually, I was totally welcoming into this community. It's, it's really, but it's not the same in every other community and every other environment. This is really quite special and unique. And I think someone, um, I forget who at the table was talking about the fact that, you know, maybe even the fact that, you know, fire is open and inclusive, that the whole ethos and, and most of, you know, people who are here live and breathe that. And so therefore, as a community, we mu are much more open and welcoming. No one's perfect. We can always improve. But maybe our role through Women for Fire is more saying, this is actually how you should be to all the other communities out there where it's not like this. And you know, maybe we just strive to be the best and we strive to, to be, to say, this is what other environments should look like. This is what other standards meetings should look like where we should all feel that we're welcome when we come into it. Um, and, and, you know, maybe, you know, I think because everyone's going, oh, why do we need this? We already feel welcome, like, this, what's going on? But maybe it's actually, this is a great thing, and what we need for this is to advocate that other communities should be like this and should be as open as this one. Plus a thousand. My company recently made me start, and I don't, you know, don't tell anyone, uh, using DICOM, and a big moment for me, and I went to one of the working group meetings, and it was terrifying. <laughs> and, you know, I think back to, I think one of the first conversations I had with Lloyd was like, don't say anything on the Zulip that you wouldn't regret. I have no problem kicking people out. And that was so cool, because it was like, oh, you're fostering inclusivity. You have no problem removing people who don't also foster that. Yeah, not in DICOM. And so, like, plus one, I mean, not to pick on them, they're, you know, they, they, but to pick, on, to pick on them. Yeah, I'll be you in know, other environments. Yeah, yeah. I was like, to pick on them a little bit, it was so jarring where, like, we do spend all this time and we should still advocate, but there's definitely still so many um, could be helped yes. pieces as well. Yeah, and I, well, I'm gonna put my clicker because this was the topic I wanted to go to, but we went here already a few minutes ago. Uh, I was also struggling with, with this question, like how active is it, how much of an issue should we talk, but the, the number of people, women that came to me today to tell me how glad they were that I went on that stage and that I talked about this topic and that I shared that recap and that I said their things that like everyone brought to me during lunch, but that they recognized, it's, I'm, I'm surprised by that. There were so many people coming to say that. So although the community is friendly, there's still a lot of women needing the fact that we talk about this and that we encourage them. So yeah, definitely that's, I think the, sh the best shout out I can do and it's probably the easiest to, to act on, like just from now on is know that it helps if you encourage someone, know that you can be a supporter or cheerleader or whatever word you want to use by just uh, confirming uh, that it's good what someone's doing and that it's not stupid to ask a question. And even if the question is stupid, which probably doesn't exist, but that you can still ask it and that, that it will help you. And I was surprised by how many uh, persons came to me and said, yeah, that, that was good to, to see that I was on the stage. Do we have other things? It would be so, so nice to, to talk about it and know like simple things we can do from tomorrow on or I don't know how we can help each other or ideas that we can bring to practice. Do, do you guys are you you are hold, holding the mic so you'll have an yeah. idea, I guess. So I, I just have kind of maybe a more of a practical question. So I know there's been a lot of talk about R6 and like that being a, um, a release where we're starting to try to kind of formalize things. And then I hear maybe we do have this bias. We aren't represented well in the resources that we have. If I have like, this has been my experience of a, a couple different clinical spaces as a woman, where can I contribute that? And like, how does that work with getting it into modeling and like actually validating whether or not our current kind of resources fit for our experience? Because it sounds like it's not just me, like this is a continuous, this is an issue. Who would like to answer that question? I think Dan can answer that question around how. Yeah, I, I was also secretly <laughs> looking at Dan, but he didn't raise his hand. <laughs> you get the mic anyway, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I have a follow up on a different topic later. But um, so, uh, I mean, the best mechanism is through participation and registering those as official comments, you know, through the ballot process and the work group process. I mean, I think um, there's uh, there are additional things we can do to raise, I'll say, 
priority or visibility to those things, and this group can be a part of that within the sort of informal channels, but I think the way to, um, to get action is through the, the sort of normal ways. But here's what I would say is, how might we think about together uncovering more of these, uh, I'll, I'll call them hidden spots uh, in the specification that do need more attention? That is something you know, um, we have, as a community, struggled with looking across the big speck of fire. How do we get the right attention in the right places? Because there's a lot to go through as we move towards R6. Um, and so we could definitely use some help in ensuring that the right uh, sort of spotlight is that the spotlight is placed in, in the right areas. And I look to all of you to help. So I'll pick on you for a second. You want to go through the right processes. Now, uh, as someone who has had to do this on her own and dig through lots of documentation to figure out what the hell that means, well, how would you suggest someone who is new figure out what is the right process and how, how to kind of actually go through that comment period? Yeah, I was going to actually suggest something a little bit further upstream from submitting ballot comments. Uh, and it ties into the fact that the Women for Fire stream on Zulip isn't as active as it perhaps could be. Um, I would love for everybody in this room to say, how do we represent X, something that you feel passionate about or you think is underrepresented. And for us to test and say, do we have a solution for that? Um, I mean, the, the menstruation question was a case in point example, but there's lots. And the reality is people who have ideas about where, how do we do this, aren't necessarily people that we want to say, OK, let's sign you up for a JIRA account and show you how to find the resource uh, to submit the comment against. I mean, totally supportive of trying to get as many people as humanly possible onto JIRA, because I want everybody to be empowered to provide feedback. And that is the formal way that we provide feedback. And I want everybody to feel comfortable doing that. But it shouldn't be the only way to engage. The, the other consideration from a specification perspective is that the specification itself feels diverse. So one of the things that I try to do when I'm creating examples is to make sure that the doctor isn't necessarily a man and they're not necessarily white and the spouse isn't necessarily of a different gender and that we have those kinds of other experiences represented in the specification. But it would be useful for there to be more eyes. And just think about, as you're looking at the specification, does this actually represent a broad community? Does this represent a non-Northern um, uh, European, uh, North American sense of the world? The, the more that we have um, a specification where people can see themselves, the more comfortable they're going to feel as well. So there's, there's a number of different things that we can do, but I think just, I mean, yes, not everybody wants to hang out on Zulip, and that makes me sad. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of a good way to engage uh, a cross-section of the community from lots of different countries, there isn't much else that we have that's as good as that. Yeah, and so plus one, I think, to, the reason I was picking on you is, um, as a female, the amount of times you see like microaggressions in the day, 99, you know, it, it's so many that one in a specification is not gonna trigger me to go create a JIRA account, figure out how to do that, read the whole thing, make a comment to the government, because it's just, you kind of get callous to it, and so I guess maybe this is a uh, figuring out with with folks like Dan, how can we make it easier to say, hey, I think this is weird. Like someone else who knows what they're doing should maybe look into it without having you know make it as easy as possible to bring it up, because otherwise we'll just ignore it, like all of you know the other 999 things that happen during the day. And I feel like like Jira kind of sometimes. I feel like. Jira, sometimes. <laughs> okay. 
so I, I feel like sometimes when I submit a change request, there's like this this like burden of responsibility. Like I need to know what to ask for. I need to know how to model this thing. And I think maybe the scenarios I'm trying to understand, I'm a modeler. I don't even know how to like what's the best option. And so yeah, I think that I love the idea of like this is what the scenarios that we'd like to see maybe prioritize and then figure out is there a fit. I think that's great. So I get some red signs from Miriam. So I, I have a few wrap-up comments. The good news is that we can continue talking about this, just not here and not right now. Um, so let's definitely do that. So that would be my first uh, for now. I really like the idea of ma making sure that use cases are available with all different settings, because that makes, the, makes it come alive. And yes to the invitation for everyone to, even if there's a process or a standard way of doing is maybe make an effort to make uh, these topics easier than the regular process to make sure they catch up because they're behind. Make so the right I, thing to do the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Number one mantra. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Vivian. And thanks, everyone, for uh, participating. Thanks, Martina, as well.